Okay, guys. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Vibhor Bansal, uh, and uh, thanks for the uh, you know uh, thanks for joining the second session on the eGov Digit Partner Training uh, Workshop. The workshop is running for three days, uh, and today is the first day. In the morning session, we talked about uh, the overview of digit implementation, where we uh, covered uh, the you know what are the uh, different aspects of digit why it is a, a you know preferable a platform for uh, urban local bodies to implement how the program runs as, as it's uh, what is the governance model what what are the skill set requires uh, to implement digit and what are the infrastructure requisites for the for the digit in this session uh, where we have uh, subhashini uh, srinivasan uh, with us, uh, we'll uh, go a little deeper into the architecture, microservices, and the coexistence of uh, of digit platform, and that is where we'll cover. In the following session, we'll go further deep dive into uh, into the DevOps uh, that will be starting from four o'clock. Uh, few announcements: uh, Please use chat for interaction uh, with uh, with everyone. Uh, use Q and A box for uh, putting up your questions. You can upvote uh, any existing questions so that uh, I or Subhashini would know that which question is getting most traction. And at the end of the session, uh, your screen will be redirected to a feedback, which will be about thirty second feedbacks uh, uh, about this session. So please do leave your feedback. This helps us in future uh, programs. Now I won't take much of a time, uh, and I request uh, Subhashini to, uh, you know, to kick off a session. Thank you. You're on mute, Subhashini. Yeah. Thanks, Vibhor. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, uh, folks. Welcome to the Digit Platform Architecture webinar. Uh, I'll just share my screen briefly. Okay, hope everybody can see the screen. Vibhor, can you see my slide deck? Yes, we can see the slide deck. You can put it on the slide sheet. Sure. Yes. Okay, so welcome yes. to the Digit Platform Architecture webinar. Uh, I hope some of you got to attend some of the earlier sessions that happened this morning around Digit, and that would have given you the context for what Digit is, what we do here at eGov. Uh, this session is going to be a, a technically focused session oriented towards primarily architects and developers, and we will do a deep dive on digit architecture. Um, so uh, there will be plenty of time for Q&A at the end, like Vibhor mentioned. Uh, primarily the content that I'm going to cover in this presentation today is going to fall under four broad categories. Uh, the first one is going to be, you know, what problem are we solving? Again, you would have heard of this from some of the earlier sessions, so I'll not go into too much detail there. Uh, but I will set the context for what is the problem we are solving, what is the domain that we are in, uh, what is the space that we are in, and then we'll talk about how Digit as a platform uh, solves these problems or helps, uh, you know, solves these problems. And then we'll uh, do a deep dive on Digit architecture, where we'll talk about various aspects of Digit and how it's been architected to solve some of these uh, problems at scale. And then finally, we'll also touch upon how to build on top of Digit, how we are enabling the ecosystem. We as the platform team are helping our partners and the ecosystem build on top of Digit. And what are some of the uh, features you know, that will uh, uh, catalyze this? Um, so that's it. So we'll get started. Uh, but before we get started, uh, I just we just want to send out a couple of quick polls so that we get an understanding of uh, you know, where you're coming from, how our audience looks like. So Vibhor, if you could kindly send out the poll, that'll be great. Thank you, Mr. Vashni. The poll is live now, uh, folks can look at. We'll keep it for about 30 seconds so that we can get an adequate response. Sure. There are two questions.
Okay, uh, we have got a response from about 45 uh, folks uh, and I hope you could see the results here. Yeah, yep. So it looks like we have a majority, 69% of folks who have heard of Digit, but they have not um, installed or used it. And we've also got a lot of developer folks here today. Hi, developers. We've got some managers and a couple of architects. Okay, sounds good. Thank you so much. Um, so we'll get started. Um, okay, so let me just start with a bit of context. This is a slide that you might have seen in the morning when Varun Basu presented. Um, so essentially, if you look at government, right, if you try to break it down into a very simple input output sort of a flow diagram. Government is an entity that collects a bunch of taxes, fees, fines, it incurs debts, and it distributes grants, right? These are your inputs into the government. All this flows through a finance pipeline and it gets allocated to various different departments or arms of the government. And ultimately, each of these departments essentially spews out one of three outputs. Either the output is some kind of infrastructure or there is service delivery, or there is benefit transfer, which eventually reaches the citizens. This is essentially the function of the government. And if this process works efficiently end to end, then we've got good governance, right? So digit is an open source digital public good that essentially works in this problem space to solve the problem of digital governance. We do it by providing reusable building blocks to build, deliver, and govern citizen services. So even though the beneficiary is the citizen, Digit touches on all the different stakeholders in this entire ecosystem, right? For citizens, Digit enables ease of access to all kinds of services. For policymakers and researchers, Digit enables ease of policymaking by making uh, you know, data available to them in a timely manner, and this is high quality data. Uh, and for administrators, we improve ease of administration by providing them uh, transparency, right? By providing them a view into the various processes and how things are functioning so that they can monitor and improve it all the time. And finally, for employees and vendors, uh, we improve their day-to-day -day functioning by making their jobs easier, by helping them become more effective, by delivering the tools that they need to do a good job, right? So essentially, digit touches on all different aspects of governance. Now, this problem of uh, governance and digitization is something that's pretty old, right? It's nothing new ever since the advent of technology, people have been trying to use technology to improve so many things at so many levels. And we all know this, there are so many platforms also out there available. So what is it that Digit does differently? And how is it better than the traditional way of doing things? So let's just have a brief look at this. I won't spend too much time here. Uh, the traditional approach basically is when a department has a problem that it needs to solve, it approaches a vendor, it gives a business requirements document uh, and you know gives them a bunch of specifications and the vendor builds an application that solves for that specific use case. It can be one app or multiple apps. So you have a user interface, you have some business logic and you have some data sitting in the database. Uh, now, this is just one department in a government when you have multiple departments and everybody is off building their own applications to solve their specific problems, you essentially have a proliferation of so many apps out there and each of them is sitting in a silo, right? The data from department A is going and sitting in one database, from department B it's in another database. So you've got all these silos that are isolated, they don't talk to each other, um, data gets locked. Uh, in uh, you know, a particular department's database and there is no uh, integration. The cost of integration is high and uh, you know, the applications are not designed for scale typically. And you know, the data is unavailable for administrators who need to have an overarching view of what is going on across departments. And for employees, you've got multiple logins, multiple websites where they have to remember username, password, et cetera. And that, that's not a good thing. And uh, all this eventually leads to a fragmented experience for citizens where they are dealing with multiple user interfaces, different styles, and you know, fragmented service delivery, right? And uh, so this is the traditional approach and it does not work beyond a point. So 
So what does Digit do that is different? Why, what makes us unique, right? So Digit follows the platform approach. It enables shared data and shared services, which are uh, you know imagined as building blocks. A building block is essentially the most uh, basic, you know, fundamental thing that can be done, a fundamental unit of work that can be done. And these can be composed into services, which can further be recomposed into other applications. So if you look here, the yellow box, let me just enable my laser pointer. I hope everybody can see it. So you've got your uh, yellow box here, which is what we call the foundation or digit core platform, right? So the core platform has a bunch of shared data registries. It has a bunch of building block services. It's got a bunch of common reference data, right? And we've got in eager, we've got multiple missions which run on the digit platform. So the urban platform, for example, sits on top of digit. It uses the registries and the services, and it also creates its own services and its own shared data registries. Similarly with sanitation, with health and whatever other platform anybody wants to build on top of digit. Um, so urban platform has some registries which is specific to its domain, right? Sorry. And uh, it's got its own set of services which are specific to urban. Now, if somebody wants to build something on top of the urban platform, they can in turn, you know, compose these services that the urban platform exposes and build something on top. So you can essentially keep on building like this, just like a Lego building block structure. Uh, and then you've got this green box, which is essentially your, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, portals where citizens, employees, and administrators interact with digit. So you've got a citizen portal where they can track their applications. You've got an employee portal, which gives them, you know, a sense of uh, what are all the action items they need to take, what do they need to do today, what is still pending. And you've got an administrator portal, uh, which is essentially a, what we call a decision support service, right? Uh, it gives them an overview of overall what is going on uh, in this particular module. This kind of a structure, this platform approach essentially uh, leads to better decision making. It improves coordination. It reduces wasteful efforts in building the same services again and again. And it provides a unified experience for all the people who are uh, using the system. And everybody is looking, and this is very important, everybody is looking at a shared single source of truth, looking at a single uh, you know, source of data, which is validated which is sitting in your registries. And so everybody is on the same page when it comes to making decisions. So when we uh, talk about platforms, you know, it's a very abstract term sometimes. And um, I heard this in one of the presentations a colleague gave, right? And that sort of resonated with me. I just want to share that with you guys before we move on. Um, so essentially, uh, you know, in the early 20th century, we had the invention of the internal combustion engine, which replaced horses as the mode of transport. And it revolutionized, you know, how human beings have moved about uh, in the course of human history, right? Uh, and the internal combustion engine, if you look at it, it is a standard. It has been defined in a certain way, right? It has a certain set of inputs, it has a certain set of outputs, and it has been defined in a very standard way. Now, if you look at what people have done with the internal combustion engine, you know, people have built automobiles, right, for personal transport. People have also built agricultural implements uh, to be used in farms. Uh, people have built construction equipment that's used in industries. You know, so many other things that have been built on top of this thing called the internal combustion engine. This internal combustion engine, you can essentially call as a platform, right? And all these applications that is uh, that it has in all these different domains, people have built solutions for their particular use cases, right? They've used this platform and they've built solutions. So you can think about the digit platform in that way. This really helped me kind of, uh, you know, think of it from a different perspective. I'm sure all of you have used uh, platforms, we all use it in our daily lives. We've got Facebook and Twitter and Google and so many other things, right? And all of these are platforms. Uh, and, you know, the range of openness, the degree of openness varies, but we do use platforms all the time. So this is how you can think of digit. It's a platform which can be used in multiple domains. It can be composed in different ways in different domains and used. 
But whenever we speak of platform, there are some design principles that a platform needs to adhere to. And these are the ones that we adhere to, right? We are open and standards driven, which means there is no vendor lock-in, right? For data and key services where we are stuck without the ability to extract it and extend it and integrate with it, right? We use open standards so everybody can understand what is going on and integrate with us. We are interoperable. At Digit, we follow, um, we follow API-driven uh, development uh, that improves ease of integration. We accelerate sharing of information. It enhances visibility and reduces the cost of coordination. Uh, the next one, unbundling. Again, this is extremely important. You know, this is not a monolithic platform. We have uh, broken it down into fundamental building blocks that can be used, scaled, and evolved independently because each service has its own sort of a life cycle, has its own usage patterns. And all these different services need to be able to scale in a different way. You cannot scale a monolithic platform, you know, all in one go. So all these different services that we have broken it down into, they can all scale in a different way and they can be reused. We'll talk more about that in the upcoming slides. The next one is minimalism. So minimal functionality uh, is something that we strive for in all our services. We want our services to be minimal. Uh, we want the rules to be defined clearly, but we also don't want to impose too many constraints. And we want to keep it highly configurable so that when we are dealing with a space uh, such as the government space, right, where there is a breadth of context in which this platform may need to operate, we need to have it extensible and configurable. We don't want to bound it too much where, you know, it can only be applicable to one particular scenario or, you know, a um, few scenarios, right? So minimalism is something that we aim for, but at the same time provide, you know, the uh, scaffolding on which you can configure your services. Digit is very scalable. This has been proven. Uh, and, you know, we've got a lot of other impact stories that some of the other teams may have already shared with you. Um, we, uh, we can do India scale. Digit is secure, it's reliable, and we are also striving for ease of use. Uh, we want to make sure that it's easy to use across the board from you know, deployment, development, integration, uh, operations, everything. So we are working on that. And uh, Digit is also inclusive, it's cloud agnostic. Uh, it has built-in support for uh, localization, multiple languages, right? So these are some of the platform design principles that uh, Digit espouses. So just want to touch on some of the feature and functionality highlights, right, of Digit. Number one, I told you that platforms are, you know, they come in varying flavors. Um, they are, some are closed, some are open, some are open, but they're not open source. So we are an open source platform. All our code is available on GitHub. Um, and, you know, anybody can have a look at it. Uh, and we welcome contributions. We are based on a microservices architecture um, and uh, we've got domain-driven decomposition. Uh, number three, we've got a lot of data registries as a single source of truth. And we build, uh, we advocate the uh, usage of registries as a single source of truth. This is something again, we'll discuss in some of the upcoming slides. We've got a workflow service and we you know, advocate for a workflow-based design approach, which sort of breaks the domain down into a simplistic problem statement. And then, you know, you can design from there. Uh, we've got uh, analytical dashboards built into Digit. They can be configured to show your visualizations, um, you know, specific to your module. We support multi-tenancy. Digit supports API-first design and all our services are built with this in mind. Uh, all our API specs are public for uh, anybody to have a look at. We've got extensive documentation, both functional documentation as well as other kinds of documentation around Digit. In fact, almost all the things that I've discussed in this uh, presentation, you'll be able to find on our websites. Uh, core.digit.org, docs.digit.org, feel free to have a look. We are also working on putting together some how-to guides for the partners and community and ecosystem so that, you know, that will be helpful uh, to deploy, to design, to develop on top of digit. This is also, again, available on our websites. You can all have a look. And uh, we've got a great community for support. There are discussion boards uh, out there where you can discuss a digit, post your queries, get answers, and also learn you know, what others are doing on top of digit and sort of build a shared knowledge base. 
we are MIT licensed, so partners are free to build and extend Digit as they see fit. So I'm going to take a pause here. Um, if there are any questions, I'd like to just open it up a little bit for questions, and then we can again um, start. And uh, Vibhor, if you could uh, share that poll, that'll be great. We've got another poll coming up for you. Uh, so please do respond. Vibhor? Yes, I'm, I'm making it live. Okay. So we have this poll in front of you. You again have about 30 seconds to respond. Also, in the meantime, if you have any questions on what uh, Subhashni has covered so far, please do put in your questions in Q&A box. This poll is just so I can get a sense of, you know, to tailor the content accordingly. Um, so this will be very helpful. Cool. So we have got some results there, and I'm sharing those. Okay. Awesome. Great responses. Yeah. Yep. We've got a lot of people who work with API gateways, Postman, Kubernetes, Kafka, Swagger, Open API. Great. Great. Okay. Sounds good. Um, okay. So now moving on. Yeah, Srijit, I'm seeing your question. Uh, yeah, the digit platform can be downloaded and installed on premise also. Yes. Okay, so let's talk about digit architecture. So, just to clarify some terminology before we uh, go forward, I know you must have heard this registry services APIs. Uh, you know, throughout the day in multiple sessions, and you'll continue hearing it also. So just to make sure we are all on the same page, right? We all know what APIs are. I, I'm sure many of you would have used APIs and you have built some also. And we all know what services are, right? A service is just, you know, microservice. It provides a way to work on some data and, uh, you know, that's it. Now, registries, right? What is a, res a registry? What is a data registry? We keep referring to it. It is essentially a repository of validated, verified, reusable data that can be used across, that can be shared, right? So this quote that I've put up on the screen is from Sunbird. As the world becomes data rich, it is essential that various data about people, entities, geographies, resources, assets, etc., are made available in electronic registries with open APIs for other applications to validate and use this data, right? This verified data. Um, this is even more critical when it comes to people and entities where various claims can be electronically validated against such registries via open APIs, right? So essentially it is a fundamental piece of data that lives on forever. It's a single source of truth. It can be reused, it's validated, it's verified. Right? That's what we call as a uh, registry. One of the most common examples of building block registry is Aadhaar. Right? Uh, Aadhaar by itself, it doesn't do anything. Right? It doesn't solve any problem. But it is a registry. It provides identity verification in a secure, reliable, uh, you know, simple way. And the applications that use Aadhaar and have built on top of it, using it as a building block have become, uh, you know, quite popular and very successful. So Aadhaar is an example of a registry. So when we refer to registries, this is what we mean. Okay, services, I think all of you know, and you know, you know about APIs also. So, um, so just before we go into the architecture, let's just talk a little bit about how a government service works, right? There are shared services in each government workflow, if you look at it, there are a bunch of things which are common. One is a user is required to register somewhere. They will log in, they'll apply for some service. They will upload a bunch of docs. Uh, they'll make a payment, you know, they'll get a bill and they are informed and tracked of progress. 
uh, there is some workflow which is initiated at the end of which you know something is verified or certified and then the service is delivered and then the user can download some sort of artifact and uh, along the way maybe if they need support they can reach out for help they should be able to give feedback uh, and uh, you know uh, people should be able to monitor and improve this entire service delivery process so these are some of the common concepts across all government departments across all service deliveries so these have been abstracted away and put into the digit platform as building blocks right so that you can use it in all the different modules that you are building similarly you've got shared data registries i just uh, talked about what a registry is right you can look it up on the sunbird website uh, what an electronic registry is if you'd like to know more so you've got user registry right a user registry or a citizen registry is common across all modules uh, the state of uh, kerala or the city of chennai for example is going to have the same citizens you know performing different things across various departments so this is something that is easily shared across different modules same thing with vendors with employees with properties licenses right there are so many other uh, registries which can be shared uh, across departments and then again you've got a bunch of similar uh, applications right like you've got you need a citizen portal you need employee portal vendors need to have some kind of an app you need an analytics dashboard for an administrator right so these are some of the commonalities and that's what digit has done digit has broken down the problem into a common set of building blocks and abstracted it into the digit core platform we we'll look at the digit architecture now so what you're seeing on the screen is a detailed architecture diagram of digit again this is available on all the digit websites that you can have a look at um essentially you have an api gateway right behind which a bunch of services sit and you've got user facing portals uh, right here you've got you know a citizen dashboard and you've got employee dashboards and from here citizens interact with the various services the api gateway is responsible for authorization and authentication and it works with the user service to provide auth it works with the access uh, to provide uh, authorization and we used uh, and we use role based access control and you've got a bunch of services here i'll just touch on a few key services and then you know if you need more detail on any of them we can have a, a discussion in the q and a um so you've got the user service which helps you with auth uh, we've got a role service which is access control it essentially limits access to certain apis to only people with certain roles uh, we've got a localization service which enables translation into multiple uh, local indian languages we've got a file store which enables you to upload any documents there are apis for all of these microservices right so you've got a file store Uh, which enables you to upload and download documents and uh, you've got an encryption service which essentially masks pii data before storing it in the database you've got a location service which is nothing but a kind of a boundary service which uh, returns you know the administrative boundaries a uh, boundary hierarchy for a particular uh, tenant for a particular ulb uh, this is a key service the master data service is a key service we call it mdms master data management service um so aside from services registries and apis there is one more building block which i forgot to add there which is reference data right each module has some kind of reference master data that needs to be set up once or maybe you know infrequently in between that the module uses during its lifetime okay this can be things like for example you know boundaries i just now mentioned uh each state can have administrative boundaries electoral boundaries revenue boundaries uh you know then these are things that don't change often uh they are probably set in stone or maybe they change once in 2 3 years or once in 5 years these can be stored in the master data management service as json configurations okay these don't live in the database you can just put it in uh, github in the master data uh, management service we'll pick it up from there and uh, use it Uh, other examples of reference data are property types trade license types employee roles maybe all the departments in a particular state things like that right so this is important that you know we need to identify we need to make that distinction between registries and reference data 
And this is again, one of the key things that Digit uh, you know, espouses that you make this distinction between a registry and reference data. Um, some of the other services that we've got are, you know, you can read through this. We've got a report service, billing, collection. We've got a configurable payment gateway. We've got a configurable PDF service that will generate any PDF that you want. Um, the other important uh, piece is workflow. So we've got a workflow service, which is a simple state machine. And typically all garment processes involve workflows. And this is a configurable piece that can be composed into any module, any new module that you write. Uh, these two services are also key, the persister and the indexer. All microservices do not interact or do not write into the RDBMS directly. They all write into a Kafka queue, right? And this persister is a configurable service, which essentially does the mapping between the data which has been put on the Kafka topic by a service, it transforms it and maps it to the uh, schema that this service has defined in the relational DB. I hope that makes sense. Basically, the microservice pushes some data that it wants to write into the DB in Kafka topics as JSON. We, at the end of the pipeline, you've got a bunch of tables that are there. And this JSON data eventually needs to go sit in tables and the persister does this mapping. And how does it do it? It does it through a configuration that the service has to define. Basically, you have to tell the persister how to map this JSON to what table and how it needs to insert, update, you know, query, delete, et cetera. The other important piece here is uh, the indexer. You can see that there are there is a RDBMS and there is also an analytical database. So we've got a separation of transactional versus OLAP database. The persister pushes the data into RDBMS. The indexer pulls the data from the queue at the same time, right, real time, and it pushes it into Elasticsearch, which is our analytical DB. So there is no ETL, batch load, et cetera. Everything happens real time live. And again, the indexer is very similar to the persister. You can write configuration for it, tell it what data to pick up, how to enrich it, and what you want to push into Elasticsearch. Okay. Um, these two services are pretty key services. You've also got some notification services, right? If you uh, want to send an SMS or an email. So we've got a generic notification service, which will take care of it for you. Uh, on top of your analytical database, we've got this uh, you know, dashboard sitting on top of it. This is what I spoke about for your basic analytics and things like that. Um, this is a configurable dashboard again. And uh, you know it looks into Elasticsearch and it displays certain visualizations, which is configurable. Okay. So this is the overall architecture. Um, I just walked you through some of these key services, so I'll not go over this again. Somebody is asking, how are we going to manage version upgrades? Okay, we'll take that at the end. Is MFA supported for user access and uh, authentication? We right now uh, do SMS-based uh, authentication for users. We send an OTP. And that's how we validate a user when they register. Okay, cool. So on to the next one. So this is again, just another way of looking at the platform, nothing you know new or unique. Just wanted to give this view because in Digit, we speak of backbone services, which is essentially your database, your queues, your caches, and your analytical database. On top of it, we call what is the core services. This is your core platform. We just discussed all these services just now, so I'll not go into it in depth. And then you've got a bunch of applications on top, which use these, right? Building plan approval, trade license, public grievance, property tax, uh, et cetera. And all of these things, this list of services and applications is not complete. This is just to give you a different perspective on the layers in Digit, right? And all of this uh, is deployed using Kubernetes, Helm, and Docker. And uh, we have CDCI, we use Jenkins, and we've got an observability stack, which is Prometheus, Grafana, Jaeger, Kibana, et cetera. Um, okay, this is what we talked about uh, in, about the decision support dashboard, which is basically your analytical data, which is just available in Elasticsearch real time. And you can build dashboards to visualize on top of it. One additional thing is that even telemetry data from UI modules 
also get sent to Elasticsearch uh, through a JavaScript library. If that is injected in the front end, then the front end starts emitting these events. And that also goes and sits in Elasticsearch. So if you need to look through that data to understand user patterns and things like that, that is also possible in digital, right? Um, the, the key thing is that none of these dashboards, you don't have to write code from scratch. These are just configurable dashboards that you can use. Um, an example of that is this um, eChavani performance smart board. This is a live uh, dashboard that is out there that is built on top of digit. This is a screenshot, right, of what you can do. I'll just show you a brief kind of um, walkthrough of it. Let me just share my uh, screen. I hope you can see it. So if I look at eChavani, right, this is eChavani. This is the dashboard. It's public. Any of you can go have a look at it. Uh, so I'll actually show you from eChavani. So if you let search for eChavani, you will come here, right? Click on this performance smart board, and this is where you'll land up. And you will essentially see this is what Digit can offer in terms of analytics and more probably. Now, if you click on, let's say, trade license, right? You can see that, uh, you know, total number of applications, how many are in process, how many are pending, what is the total process, how many have been issued, right? And you can see by category, by status, all these aggregations and visualizations have been defined through config by channel. What are the top performing cantonment boards? CB stands for cantonment board, bottom three, and also like a row wise data. So this is something that they have implemented across uh, different modules for complaints, for uh, mCollect. I'll leave you to explore this on your own time. It's just called eChavani. You can Google for it and uh, you know find it. So this is just a screenshot taken from there. Mm -hmm. Please have me uh, portals uh, link to your chat. Okay, just in case. Okay, cool. Thanks, Vipul. Yeah. Um, so uh, another major feature that Digit offers is multi-tenancy. Uh, you can configure. Uh, it gives you the flexibility to configure your own master data, override the parent microservices, or build new microservices only for that particular tenant. Right. A tenant is just the context in which a service executes, right? What reference data it has access to, what are the services it has access to. So in this example, you can see there is a tenant level one. Let's say this is a state tenant, right? And then maybe uh, you've got a city level tenant. So in this case, a city level tenant, it may have some things which are very different from state level config. So this is going to override some of that reference data, uh, right? And also some services, maybe it needs a customized version you can deploy it in your uh, city level tenant, uh, right? So this is a child tenant and that's a parent tenant. And the number of tenant levels in digit is also something that can be configured. You can have multiple levels, state department, sub department, so on and so forth, okay? Um, digit also offers multiple deployment options. I think this will be covered in great detail probably in the DevOps session. Uh, but basically, each department can deploy their own instance of Digit if they want, build their solutions in a federated manner so that overall still you'll have some interoperability between various instances of Digit. Uh, you can also have uh, deployments at a state level where everybody shares the same common instance of Digit. That is also possible. So there is flexibility here. There are a lot of options and these are described in our documentation. So you can have a look at that. Um, the other thing, Digit comes with um, CI as code, continuous integration as code. And this is something that we use internally and we also offer it to our partners and customers so that they can build and deploy services in a timely manner in a streamlined way, okay? So essentially what happens is uh, you commit code to your Git repository. When you deploy the Digit CI as uh, code, uh, pipeline, right? It will set up Jenkins for you. It will set up a whole bunch of pipelines for you. Uh, it will integrate with your Docker registry, which you will have to create. And, you know, it will also integrate with your environments. All this is configurable. Uh, so when you run the uh, CI uh, installer, it will set all this up for you. So when you make any code commit to Git, Jenkins is going to be able to uh, detect the change, pull it, 
build your service, push it to Docker, and then start deploying using Helm. And then Helm is going to pull all these different images from your Docker registry and deploy it into uh, whatever your cloud may be. You can see that there is an on-premises cluster. I think somebody was asking about that. Uh, you can deploy on um, Google GCP or AWS, whatever, right? Anywhere, private cloud, anywhere. So it, this is how it's done. And this is something that we use internally and we also offer our customers. And this is another great feature of Digital. Uh, so just coming to the technology stack, these are all the things uh, that we use. These are all the tools we use. We've got on the user layer, we've got React, HTML, CSS, Flutter, JavaScript. We use the Netflix uh, Zool API gateway. We use Swagger, Open API to develop our API specs. We use uh, Spring Boot, Kafka, Postgres, Postman to test our backend, Redis as the cache, Node.js. For our analytics layer, we use Elasticsearch. Uh, for deployment, we use Docker, Kubernetes, Jenkins, Terraform, Ansible, Git, Spinnaker. Monitoring, we use Prometheus, Grafana, uh, and Kiban. All of these are open source tools. Um, and to make it easy for our partners and government uh, to you know, uh, use Digit, right? Uh, we have made sure that there is extensive documentation and there are these how-to guides which are getting built, right? I've linked to the website here, core.digit.org. You can look in the guides section and you'll see a bunch of guides. How do you install, right? Like how do you do a quick setup? How do you do a production setup? We've got a data setup guide, design, developer guide, and operations guide. Some of these guides are works in progress, but we are building on it. Uh, and a lot of them already have some great content for you to get started with, right? So these are some of the things that uh, we would love our partners to take a look at and use. And this is how we are enabling you guys to build on Digit. We've also got extensive functional documentation for all the different services, you know, how to configure, how to use, what to do. And again, this is pretty much the same thing that I just walked through in the presentation. You can find it on uh, urban.digit.org. Um, okay, so I'll just um, quickly get through building for digit and then we'll open it up for questions. So in this section, we primarily just want to talk about, you know, how we are enabling others to build on top of digit, how we ourselves have leveraged the digit platform. So if you look at it, you know, digit urban, right? It uses digit core platform services, it uses the registries, right? And we have built, eGov has built 12 plus uh, urban modules on top of digit. And these are all some of the modules, right? Property tags, this, that, accounting, trade license. You would have seen this before. We use Digit for all our missions, not just Urban. Uh, for building the services and their respective interfaces, we use uh, the Digit platform and the Digit principles. So we build citizen apps, vendor apps, employee dashboards, admin dashboards. Everything has been built using our own uh, stack. Um, these are some sample screenshots, like how it looks. Uh, you know, for an employee, how it looks on a mobile app, how a citizen dashboard looks like, and, you know, how you can look at a few things. Uh, and finally, the digit ecosystem, right? For a platform to be successful, it needs to align with policy and the ecosystem. The ecosystem needs to adopt, and that is how a platform becomes successful. So we've got an open digital ecosystem with 86 plus partners who have built 35 urban solutions on top of digit. Right? We've got four platforms, uh, you know, including all the other missions aside from Urban. Uh, and you know, uh, Bell, Bharat Electronics is a plat uh, partner who contributed uh, source code back into Digit. Uh, and we've also got a strong team of volunteers and contributors. You can check out some of the contributions. Uh, this is not just code contributions. This can be documentation. This can be, you know, how-to videos. Uh, just some, uh, you know, evangelization around digit. So it can be a bunch of things, it need not be necessarily code. If so, if you're interested to contribute, please do get in touch with us. Um, and we also have a community discussion board where people can, you know, post their queries, share their, uh, you know, uh, the current problems that they are hitting and also get some answers from some of the other folks who are building on top of uh, digit. So this is how we are envisioning the ecosystem is going to work out.
And we are also, we have this in pipeline digit certifications. We will soon launch certifications for design dev and DevOps. So stay tuned for announcements. Um, and finally, I've just listed a bunch of resources and references you can look at, right? These are our websites, community discussion boards, the eChavani dashboard that I mentioned. And uh, finally, the last link is a digit quick start video tutorial that someone, a volunteer put together for us. Uh, and that might be helpful to you also when you are trying to install digit, right? So that's what I want to leave you with. Thank you so much for your patience. And now we will uh, try to answer some of the questions. Okay, I think Srijit, how are we managing version upgrades? Um, we'll have a migration plan in place from version to version. There are release notes which are released with each version. Uh, right, and it's out there on our website, uh, and that lists out all the different changes that have happened, things that are breaking, th things that have been upgraded, and typically there is usually a migration plan that is put in place by our implementation teams, depending on whether you are installing fresh or you are moving from some older version to the latest version. I think that will be covered more in your uh, implementation session, which is happening later this week. I hope this gives you an overview. Hope I've answered this question. Okay, the next question, um, how long min and max does it take to install and configure digit? Okay, so uh, John, uh, this depends on your uh, skill set and capabilities. If you are somebody who's extremely familiar with Kubernetes, Docker, you know, the entire microservices architecture, even otherwise, uh, the installer, if you are employing, uh, deploying quick start digit, which is essentially a single VM, you know, Kubernetes uh, cluster install, that's probably going to take you a few hours, like three to four hours maybe to install it. Uh, if you are trying to install the production setup, that will take you again, maybe a day. Uh, again, depends on the skill set that people come with and how comfortable they are with the technical stack. But yeah, we've got pretty extensive documentation and videos and things like that to make this as easy as possible. Um, okay. Where can we get the community discussion board? Uh, I just shared the link in the presentation before, if you could kindly just uh, paste that link from the resource and references slide into the chat window, that'll be great. Yeah, Neha, I'll just, we'll just post it in the chat window. Whoops. Yeah, shared it on the chat. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, so yeah, so that is that. Uh, have you done any load testing? What is the threshold in terms of application submission and API usages? This There is no short answer to this. It's a pretty... Uh, it's going to be a pretty extensive answer, but yeah, we are doing load testing, we are benchmarking, and we'll share those on our uh, websites once we are done with that. Okay, will there be any implementation support from Digit Team if required? So uh, Anil, depends, uh, we usually work with implementation partners uh, if we are working with uh, governments, so we've got PwC who's helping us with um, implementation in Odisha uh, and also at a central level. But yeah, we do support them also. We do support our partners when they are trying to implement Digit and if they have queries, we encourage everybody to post questions or look through the community discussion boards first because pretty much, you know, that's like a compilation of FAQs, right? So if you have a problem, if you have a question, please post it there. We'll try to answer it there, or maybe you'll already have an answer from somebody else who's done it before. But yeah, we do support. Um, and I think you'll, the implementation team, Pradeep has a session later, and I think that will be covered there as well. Uh, how are the data privacy and access control mechanisms set for the Digit platform, is there any IAM mechanism set for this? So we use, uh, Pallavi, we use uh, Zool for uh, um, authorization and authentication. And we have our own definitions of access control uh, that we define in uh, MDMS. And that's what we use for access control. 
we don't have any IAM mechanism set right now for this. Okay. Um, there are multiple skill sets needed for either Dev or DevOps for Digit. Is there a training session planned by Digit in the future? How do they know how to independently implement and support a Digit solution? Uh, yeah, so I had just mentioned that, you know, we are planning to launch certifications uh, for Digit, uh, you know, DevOps, developer and uh, architects. Uh, and this is something that we are planning. It's still in the works. We'll share the details once we have finalized. And, uh, you know, you could attend those sessions and also get a certification <coughs> for Digit. Uh, and yeah, independent of that, if you'd like to learn how to do this, then you our website is always the first place to go for all this information. And then when this happens, I think that will give you the context to sort of enhance your uh, knowledge of digit. Okay. Is there any document supporting data integrity at rest as well as in motion? Uh, let me look through Pallavi. I don't know if there is any document that's readily available. It must be. Let me check and I'll get back to you on this. Okay, there are no other questions. Anybody else have any other questions? Please do speak up. Okay. Regarding registries, does Digit allow creation of newer ones? Yes, yes. When you build your new module, you can create your own registry. Example, water solution may be needed, um, may need plumber and pipe data. Exactly, yeah. So when you, this is all part of building a new module, uh, Krishna. Uh, so when you build a new module, you build your own registries, whatever you need that does not exist already on the digit platform, that is something that you can augment. Okay. Um, how change is request volumes handled? I'm not sure what this is. Pallavi, can you please elaborate? Yeah, I am not sure how to answer that. So Pallavi, you can reach out to us later maybe and explain the question. That'll be great. How is the change of request volumes? Volumes of change request. What is the change request? Yeah, we've got uh, load balancing you know, because it's a, uh, we deploy using Kubernetes as a cube cluster, we've got auto scaling policies in place for horizontal, for vertical scaling. Um, so that's one aspect of it. So you can increase the number of replicas for a particular service in Kubernetes if your volumes are going up. Yeah, if you need a clarification on these questions, maybe we can uh, uh, allow respective participant to speak and maybe since we have less some time that we could do. Sure, sure. Yeah, no worries. Yes, yeah, so if you could point me that uh, who's responsible to like to I can. No, I think it's uh, Pallavi Roy, but I got her uh, question. Okay. Actually, I took a stab at answering it also. Pallavi, I hope that, see, there are multiple things that you can do. But yeah, you, essentially, because we are deploying uh, deploying using Kubernetes, you can use auto scaling policies to increase the number of replicas and things like that, uh, and that will eventually shrink back also once you don't have that uh, volume, and that will keep it cost effective. There are other mechanisms also that can be done uh, to handle volume, and because we use Kafka, right? 
for uh, we kind of isolate the database from all these spurt and volumes and uh, everybody all the microservices push their writes to uh, kafka and we sort of streamline it from there and write into the database in an async way and that also helps us scale it doesn't gate us we are not gated by database write uh, speeds so there are uh, little bits and pieces that enable us to do this uh, throughout digit hope that answers um yeah pallavi i think you have been elaborating on the same thing if traffic increases drastically how is it managed it's what i answered how do you leverage integrate extend existing platforms are there any integrations with iudx ict ra infra etc um uh, vibor maybe you can unmute pallavi roy sure sure Well, maybe you can unmute yourself and can speak. Maybe uh, we can have a better engagement. Well, maybe I'm not familiar with what IUDX or ICTRA is, so you will have to educate me on that. Yeah. Uh, so, am I audible? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So basically, I was just trying to ask you that whether the infrastructure that the platform you've made the digital platform how do you ex uh, extend it or how do you integrate it with other states or if in case you need to extend it elaborate it or expand it in simple terms how would you do that i mean is there any kind of integrations with the currently developing platforms which are for nuis that is like if if i say for iudx it's the indian urban data exchange i see i am not aware of any existing integrations in place okay uh, so we've got these apis right that we expose to the outside world uh, through which data can potentially be exchanged but i am not particularly aware of any kind of data exchange or integration that has happened with any of these uh, platforms okay uh, icpra stands for what uh, what what does ictra stand for ictra so yeah. basically ictra um who i tell you ictra <laughs> yeah i can tell you the other term which i i have mentioned okay no worries okay fine a udx is data exchange yes it's the data exchange data exchange is it yes it's the urban, indian urban data exchange i see okay okay uh, i'll inquire and let you know but i'm not aware of any integrations with any of these uh, platforms ghanshyam if you're there maybe you can take this question i'm not sure if yeah. you're there yeah yeah i'm here yeah I you can hear me yes yes I can yeah so we don't have the integration with these two infrastructure but i want to take the uh, the first part of it integration and the extension part uh, so see this is uh, the platform which exposes the api so anyone can integrate uh, who have the uh, who has the permissions they can integrate with the platform and push their data into the system uh, or platform okay that is one way another if you want to integrate let's say with the external system so uh, from digit itself this is event ways anyway so on particular event let's say you say uh, whenever the property new property will get added you will uh, you want to exchange the data with some other department also at the same time uh, what you can do that every service trigger uh, the event asynchronously that is uh, event can be listened by a custom server which you can write so that is the part of the customization uh, also you can do basically you can write your own service deploy it without touching the uh, any any platform services you can listen to those events and integrate with the third party system okay third extension is what we have is the api gateway level so at api gateway level what we can configure is the pre hook and the post hook so let's say you want to do the certain validation before the service it reaches to the service uh, so i'll just take an example before the payment let's say you want to uh, send an notification to the citizen 
uh, so you can actually configure a pre-hook. It's a configuration, pure configuration, no coding. So once you do the pre-hook configuration, it will make that API call. You will have your custom service exposing the particular API, which you configured into the pre-hook or the post-hook. Uh, <clears throat> then it will, uh, through that service also, you can do the extension. Hope, hope you... Oh. It answers your question of uh, integration part and extension part. Yes, thanks. Yes, so much. I think we have another question from Sanjeev. I think, however, this has been answered. Uh, this it can be deployed to your own uh, on prem as well. <clears throat> so, basically, your question is uh, we can deploy it on SDC or something. Can you unmute Sanjeev? Yeah, since you can unmute and so I uh, think I think in the uh, presentation itself, uh, Shuvasni has mentioned about we are cloud agnostic. So the cloud connectivity is not necessarily mandatory. These are the Docker image, and on any environment, you can you can run it uh, without any cloud dependency. We don't have any cloud. <laughs> it is tech agnostic. It is cloud agnostic. The deployment is tech agnostic. Oh, sorry, cloud agnostic deployment. And the development is uh, tech as much. So basically, you can write uh, currently the backend what we are using for microservices. It is uh, Spring Boot, but you can write in Node, Python, whatever you you want to. So it is uh, cloud agnostic also and tech agnostic. But Sanjeev, are you asking if uh, without internet connectivity to the outside world, is it possible to deploy digit? Is that the question? No, no, no. My question is uh, we can de deploy full digit setup in on premise because yeah. right now it is uh, on the site is uh, mentioned full de deployment with uh, AWS, yeah, with Azure, but another something cloud mentioned. It. So we can everything we will deploy in on premise server. Yeah, yeah. I think Gansham just answered that. Yeah, we can deploy on premise. Yeah. If if yes, then where will all installation and configuration set up? So we will try this. Where will all installation happen? And and configuration document for on premise. It is a on site. Your site is a mention only AWS and Azure only. No, we have some information for SDCs also it, data centers. So we have, and this documentation is in progress. We are we are also extending that documentation. Uh, okay. uh, but uh, uh, yeah, these are the simple Docker images, okay? Uh, so you can uh, use even any Docker uh, orchestrator, which is like currently we are using uh, Kubernetes, but, but you are free to use uh, uh, even as simple as Docker Compose also, right? Uh, okay. But there are some pros and cons. What we have chosen, uh, chosen already, are uh, fit into the requirement of auto scaling, right? Uh, uh yeah. um, and all of that vertically and horizontally. Uh, maybe if you have a small deployment where uh, your volume is very less, you can simply use your, uh, you know, uh, Docker Compose form, whatever you want to use. Uh, but we recommend to use. Kubernetes, if they have a good amount of, uh, you know, um, request coming in. Okay. But, yes. but it is cloud agnostic. You don't need to worry about it. Okay. Uh, can you give a demo on how to create a service using Digit? This is something uh, that we'll cover in another session, Srijit. Uh, that's happening day after tomorrow, session number eight. We'll talk about how to build on top of digit. I think there's also session number seven, which also talks a little bit about it. So we'll cover this content there. I think we are over time. Vibhor, 
uh, if there are uh, any other questions, maybe you can reach out to us through Vivo and uh, email it in. Happy to answer, but I think we are running out of time right now. Uh, email ID here. You can reach out to me, and uh, we can, you know, uh, we can take your uh, responses. Uh, thank you, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Subhashini, Gansham, and everybody who could uh, join here for the session. Uh, the sessions will be made available uh, uh, via video recordings, uh, which will, as soon as we'll put up online, we'll definitely share it to all of you. Uh, Number two is please leave your uh, feedback after the session. As, as the session ends, uh, you will be redirected to a feedback form, which will take not more than 30 seconds to give your feedback. This will help us in future. Thank you, everyone. Yep. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Yep. Bye.